Good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Hainer. I'm a director with uh, Jerry Becker's Industrial Group. I'm very excited to have you guys here today for our webinar to discuss alternative ways to manage property and casualty insurance. Uh, Khan and I spent uh, quite some time on discussing these topics with our clients over the last couple of months, given the current environment and premium conversations and, and discussions coming up now. And based on our conversations, we felt like it would make sense to have um, a webinar and uh, bring these topics and uh, parts of our discussions to a broader audience. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to have these two experts, Michael and Kyle, with me today. And uh, I'm going to hand over for, to Kyle for a quick introduction. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate everyone joining us today. My name is Kyle Fergone, uh, Director with Cherry Becker Benefits Consulting. Um, we are a uh, benefits consultant and uh, property and casualty insurance uh, group within Cherry Becker. It helps consult clients on, on those lines of coverage, how to manage them uh, most effectively and, and efficiently. And Michael Aronson is, is joining us today. Michael, two minutes on yourself. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, Kyle and I work together with um, Cherry Becker clients on their risk programs to try and find the most effective and most efficient way to manage the risk. Um, and we're going to focus this morning on changes in the insurance marketplace and some alternative ways to uh, manage your property and casualty program. So with uh, no more hesitation, we're going to get into it. So appreciate again, everyone joining us today. So first and foremost, as Michael mentioned, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the trends in the marketplace, uh, what we're seeing now and what you may have already seen is, is a hardening in, in the property and casualty insurance markets. And, and just for the sake of, of the conversation today, when we're talking about insurance, it's, it's primarily or it's, it's, it's specifically around property and casualty. So things like your workers' comp, your, uh, your commercial auto, your general liability, things like that. It does not involve any of the health and benefits. Uh, so um, what we're seeing is uh, the hardening has happened over the past couple of years, but with COVID, uh, it has really taken effect to a lot of businesses, especially when cash flow has become a major concern. So these the influx of premiums have really been more meaningful to businesses now more than ever. So COVID hit, hit us, all of us, uh, personally and professionally. Uh, in, in many ways and, and has provided a lot of uncertainty in the world. And so the, the heightened uncertainty and volatility has, has led to some, some economic fallout uh, and the pandemic has impacted virtually every business as a result. And, and the insurance industry was not excluded from that. So the, the global pandemic has really put everything into a little bit of an influx and, and with uncertainty, uh, drives more conservative business decisions uh, or or just decision making. So, uh, well, COVID has really has really played a big part in what's happening with the insurance market specifically. Um, and and as a result of COVID and and you know whatever else is going on in the economy, there was there was an economic turndown um, or downturn, and and the shutting down of the economy had really impacted, again, the insurance industry and, and not, you know, your businesses and, and the insurance industry. Uh, you know, while some did flourish through through the shutdown, um, you know, many others did struggle. And the volatility was a big concern for the insurance companies because, um, you know, the, the financial markets were very volatile. And one of the components within uh, the insurance companies is the interest that they earn on the reserves. There's a lot of reserve requirements for insurance companies, and the volatility had had put them in, in a little bit of a uh, a concerning position. And so when that comes again, leads to more conservative decision making on you know when you have your capitalization requirements. And so that the economic downturn had has played a, a part of this. Add in our our new normal. Uh, our working environment of, of folks working from home uh, or, or a lot of layoffs. And so layoffs lead to lower payroll, lower payroll, and payroll is a key driver on, on premiums for carriers. And so lower payroll means lower premium. 
And so, you know, the, the insurance companies are starting to collect, uh, collect less money than they had projected on, on maintaining their business models. Another factor that we've seen in the marketplace was civil unrest. Uh, this, this led to a much higher frequency of claims, uh, property claims specifically. Uh, in essence, civil unrest and property claims are very similar to natural disaster claims, which are also spiking. There have been record hurricane uh, claim uh, related um, or hurricane related claims. There's also been you know much more wildfires than we had seen. So uh, all of this had has has had impact on uh, underwriting profits for the carriers. And, and under underwriting profits are, are essentially it's very simple. It, it's premiums that they collect versus profit or uh, claims that they pay out. And and the difference is the underwriting profit. And, and they're working off of, of certain margins there. So with all of those factors at play, um, what, what does that mean to, to the insurance markets? Well, the carriers have, have become uh, a lot more specific and, and they're, they're, their scrutiny has come up. They're, they're a lot more exclusive or uh, restrictive on, on the, the risks that they're willing to take. And so as a result, of, of becoming, um, of the scrutiny increasing, they're trying to identify the best risks and they're only gonna, uh, they're only gonna insure the best risks, but not only are they gonna insure them uh, or take on the risk, they're only gonna take it on, on on smaller amounts. Their limits are now coming down. So they're, they're unwilling to take much larger uh, risk uh, and they're only doing it on, on specific and, and better insurance or better risk or better claim uh, projections. If so I can add one that, thing, Kyle, um, yes. this is a dramatic change in the marketplace. For the last 15 years or so, rates have been either very flat or in certain lines of business actually decreasing. So uh, it's not just that these circumstances have caused rates to change. This is a dramatic difference from what we've been experiencing for quite a long period of time. Um, and having been in this industry for a long time, I can say that we probably haven't seen this hard a market in 25 or 30 years. Um, and it came very fast and it came very suddenly, um, you know, just like these changes that Kyle's talking about also seem to come on very suddenly. Yeah. And in addition to, to all the changes we're talking about, another factor is with all this uncertainty, there are less carriers in the marketplace. They, they are moving themselves from certain risks. Certain carriers are, are no longer doing uh, umbrella or excess coverage, some carriers aren't doing cyber, whatever it is, there's less capacity in the marketplace. And so with less capacity drives higher rates, simple supply and demand. So uh, just to give a picture of what's going on in the marketplace, why you're gonna see premiums going up if you haven't already, these are the multiple factors that are at play when it comes to, to insurance. So even if you have had good experience, claim experience over the past couple of years, and you're, you're gonna to start to see a hardening of the marketplace and, and ratings going up, which brings us to, there's gotta be a better solution. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but we're gonna unpack the markets a little bit further to give you more context to what's going on in the marketplace. So a little bit further down that, that rabbit hole is you know, with, with the, uh, the economy being shut down, a lot of people are working from home, you might think that claims are down, like workers' comp claims are down, or general liability claims are down, and and that might be the case. Um, you know, insurance companies may you may think that they're making more profits, but in, in actuality, not really the case. Uh, why claims have decreased? I mentioned earlier the economic shutdown came with some you know reduced payroll um, as as folks are getting laid off or they're working less time, and so with less payroll comes less premium. But the other factor at play is uh, with COVID, we, we saw an influx in litigation. Um, a lot of businesses were, were suing their insurance companies uh, for claims or they are suing other businesses for breach of contract. And so claims are being paid out. And so um, the, the actual claim dollars going out were stayed fairly flat while premiums were coming down, which again leads to uh, much lower, much lower underwriting profit. So there's a lot of conflicting forces at play in the marketplace right now that um, you know, have, have led to this hardening of the market. You know, the underwriting community has said even before all of this, 
that the premiums and reserves that were at play weren't even sufficient enough to hold the outstanding risk. You know, that is somewhat debatable from, um, you know, from our perspective, but that's the position that they're holding. And so this is, is what's leading to this, uh, this hardening of the market, as we've mentioned a, a few times now. So, Michael, you want to add anything here? Uh, no, if you want to go to the next slide. <clears throat> Would you like to jump off on this one first, or do you want me to take sure. it? I mean, the, these are the way the insurance companies are reacting to um, the changing economics. Um, much more uh, restrictive underwriting, um, you know, less capacity, the interest rates affecting their float. Um, for the last 15 years or so, the insurance companies really had a lot of um, capacity in the marketplace. There was a lot of capital chasing the reinsurance business. Hedge funds were investing a lot of money in reinsurance companies. When reinsurance product is very available, that makes primary insurance products very available and less expensive. Um, but some of that money has been taken away from the market with all these sudden changes that have gone on in the economy. So even businesses, um, with fewer claims considered more preferred by the insurance company of feeling these effects and obviously businesses with um, claims experience that isn't as good or located in areas where there's maybe catastrophic property risk or more dangerous liability hazards uh, they're really feeling the effects of the change in marketplace yeah and so with with all of this there there's got to be an alternative solution and and that's what we're here to unpack a little bit further so these, you know, many of you might be on some guaranteed cost programs, which Michael will talk a little bit, little bit about and what those are, but understanding what the cost benefit analysis is, is moving into some of these alternatives, like a deductible program or captive insurance or some more loss sensitive programs. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a big uh, influx on interest in these alternative programs, because even if you're a, are a preferred risk, and you've had great claims experience, you're gonna to start to see these, these in, uh, increases in premiums. And so there's gotta be a better way. And, and that's what we're here to talk about a little bit more. But first we have a, a polling question. So let's move on to that, Danny. Danny, are you handling the polling question? Yes, just launched, uh, and we're at a 94% of answers. Probably just one or two more people. Okay. Looks like 94% said up and 6% said down. All right. Well, 94% are correct. <laughs> so yes, it, it, you know, that's, that's a big factor at play, you know, um, uh, less capacity, um, a lot more risk brings a lot more uh, scrutiny. So the carriers are getting a lot more selective of what they want to, uh, what they want to ensure. And so uh, some of the ideas we're going to bring to the table today will actually remove you from that scrutiny. Um, you don't have to rely on the insurance carriers anymore. Uh, you can start to uh, transfer or finance your risk on your own and, and brings a lot more flexibility and autonomy to you and, and potentially uh, improve cash flow. So um, moving on. So we did, we talked about uh, what was the impact, you know, from an underwriting perspective, you know, how does that translate into claim increases, or sorry, premium increases or rate increases. And so um, it's not anecdotal. Um, these are uh, what we have viewed over the past year, what uh, what has happened uh, year over year to businesses with good loss records. So um, we have a study and we conducted a study that had the, that recorded good losses versus bad losses and how the claims have impacted. So what this is just representative of is good losses, good companies that have good risk control. And this is the best case scenario, what you should potentially see over the next year with your renewals. So as we mentioned, property uh, in property insurance for non-catastrophic claims, uh, you're gonna see a spike there from five to 15%. Uh, 
uh, your primary general liability is going to be five to ten percent, which I think is very interesting, given uh, a lot of companies are, are have shut down um, or they're not allowing um, outside parties uh, onto their property. Uh, you know, I know we're not allowed to go visit clients right now for a lot of them, and so you know, just having the GL still increase, why risk has gone down, is is pretty interesting. Um, commercial auto that had a a big swing over the past year, uh, which again is interesting when you know a lot of commercial fleets were off the roads for a good period of time. So that's uh, that's an interesting um, uh, nugget there. Workers comp. Now this this stays staying fairly flat. These are for guaranteed cost programs. So um, you know not exactly sure what the the dynamic is here, but we're going to unpack a little bit more. Michael probably provide some commentary on why we're seeing uh, work comp staying fairly flat. Uh, but then, you know, the, the big doozy is your umbrella and your excess coverage. It's, you know, we've seen uh, some of our clients getting 50% rate increases and their retention levels or their deductibles have doubled. So not only are they paying 50% more, they're retaining a lot more risk. So this has been a, a tremendous impact in the marketplace. A quick question here, uh, Kyle and Michael, just from a um, future perspective, is that do you guys feel like this is um, now to be expected year over year, or do you guys feel like this is uh, kind of a one, one-time spike and kind of flatten um, so that people can basically uh, ride it out over time? Do, do you guys have a, and I know it's very early in that uh, process, but I was wondering if you guys have a um, perspective on that topic. Uh, yeah, I can take this one. Um, I think in 2021, some of these increases may moderate a bit. Um, you know, as we get some clarity with COVID, as we have the sense that we're, you know, at the beginning of the end, maybe with the vaccine, um, that may have an impact on it. I think as the economy begins to reopen and recover, hopefully that'll have an impact. Um, but what we've done here is we've raised the baseline of where rates are. And I think that's permanent. Um, the, the rate of the increases will probably be less. I expect that to diminish, but I don't see rates going back to 2018 or 2019 levels. Um, so it means that your budget for insurance is going to be higher, even though the price will, will be more consistent going forward. That's your point. So we're gonna go through these a little bit more detail to uh, again, provide some more context and, and give more of a state of the economy. Uh, when it comes to insurance, but uh, when we're seeing with property, the pricing, um, you know, while it did spike, it it is flattening to Michael's point there. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a new baseline that is around property insurance. The, the challenge now is more around the scrutiny uh, and the underwriting process. The carriers have become a lot more selective on, on what risks they want to take. So if you know your business has been in the, or adjacent to any of the areas with a, you know, significant civil unrest um, or natural disasters, that's going to be uh, a harder pill for the underwriters to swallow. And so um, you, know, you may you may find some challenges there. And so the capacities are going to be a lot less. There's going to be a lot less options for you. And and when you have less options, the carriers can get uh, a lot more. Um, a lot more critical and and drive those pricing that pricing up uh you know the limitations as i mentioned um you know the higher probability of your maximum loss so with all of the civil unrest and natural disasters that has increased the probability of a maximum loss and that scares the underwriters and so as a result they are uh they're adjusting their their limits and what needs to be transferred to excess coverage. And they're also um, increasing their retention limits. So um, Michael, can you talk a little bit about the probable maximum loss and, and why that's more meaningful? Yeah, well, we've had, we've had some much, we've had a much more difficult time placing coverage for businesses who need higher limits of coverage, whether that's inventory building or business income. Once we start approaching that $100 million number for their risk in a, at a single location. Um, the capacity reductions of the insurance company is making it much more difficult to put those kinds of programs together. And sometimes we have to use more than one carrier to layer the program 
and that tends to increase the total cost. Um, you know, the last bullet point there also is kind of related to the to the PML calculations. Um, sometimes insurance companies won't raise the rates, but they'll insist that a building that's currently insured for 25 million should instead be insured for 35 million because that's what's going to cost to rebuild. Um, or if you're a business with multiple locations and your chance of all of them having a you know having a loss at the same time is very small but the insurance company wants to make sure that the limits that you're carrying on your policy are actually the total values added up at all those locations rather than just looking at the worst case scenario um, the scrutiny the underwriters are putting on property coverage even despite the rates um, is creating other circumstances where the total cost of the coverage is going up yeah and and on the scrutiny too so um, what's what's unique? I wouldn't say unique, but what's unique with this time is um, because uh, of the remote workforce, a lot of the work from home, uh, the carriers have uh, put in uh, a lot more, uh, let's call it submission requirements. So if you want a carrier to look at your your risk and, and look at your your coverage and your programs, they're they want that packaged up in a neat little box and and put on their table because uh they they're just not having the the ability to go through it as like they have before because of just the disconnection that they've gone gotten on or are going through right now and so um by submitting a clean uh review for the carriers and the underwriters that is going to actually help with um with your ability to get on their desk and uh, have them take a, a good look at your your program, and so working with someone that can help put that together in a clean submission is going to you know increase your chances of of getting a better uh, better program put together than uh, more of a piecemeal program. So that's just a side note. And um, you know one of the other things that we saw in our studies is you know the the businesses that are going to have a lot of impact here. Uh, it's it found that. Uh, those with you know, larger potential claims like food processing or pharmaceutical businesses um, or woodworking and recycling industries or plastic manufacturers, which I think are relevant to some of the folks on the phone today. So just something to keep in mind is you, you might see this coming up on your next property renewal. GL, uh, Michael, do you want to do you want to take this one off for and I'll, I'll kick in? Sure. There's there's the uncertainty of of how COVID infections are going to affect general liability. Um, that's certainly having an impact on uh, the way the insurance companies are are um, pricing out renewals. Um, with the difficulty in the umbrella market, some of the umbrella carriers are requiring that the underlying general liability limits, instead of being one million, two million, are now raised to two million, four million, which of course is going to increase the primary, the cost of the primary layer, and since that's also the auditable and adjustable layer based upon business activity, that increases the total cost of risk. Um, and it's really the larger businesses that are seeing the greatest increases in general liability. Um, companies with revenues probably $75 million and up, of course, it's impacted by the um, the hazardous nature of the business, what kind of product you're manufacturing, what kind of product you may be distributing, but certainly the bigger businesses are seeing the bigger increases in general liability premium. But if the umbrella carriers are gonna require a higher underlying limit, any business is gonna see an increase in their general liability cost. Yeah, and a couple of interesting points here is, um, the again, the market capacity is shrinking, so less, less carriers are, are willing to take on the risk. and uh, therefore, they're actually requiring that if, if you want them to write your general liability, you have, also have to have them write the workers' comp. So that may limit your ability to get the best in market or, or the best pricing available. So by combining those products, it limits you a little bit on what you can do in the marketplace. Um, you know, the other the other impact here is COVID. Um, there's there's an estimate that 10% of COVID deaths right now are believed to have been contracted um, from the workplace. You know, whether it's someone who contracted it um, or caught it at the workplace, brought it home and it, you know, passed it on to family and friends. And then as a result of those folks pass away. So, you know, there's there's some there's some litigation going on around that, too. So that's also played an impact, you know, as we mentioned, the increasing legal environment around this.
commercial auto, uh, as we mentioned, this this had some some significant volatility. What's interesting here is it is it is more regional based than than anywhere else than any other product really. Um, maybe maybe property is is also regional um, as well, but. Uh, at the end of the day, the the markets are exceeding their um, their uh, their capital, um, and so the the loss ratios uh, you know have not been good, and so um, it has led to driving up the the claims and the premiums or the the increased premiums have uh, led to increased claims, um, and that's a lot around is uh, litigation. Um, you know, there's a lot more uh, higher severe. Um, or higher magnitude claims that are going through litigation right now. Um, you know, we all know we can't text and drive. Doesn't mean people aren't doing it um, or doing some other uh, ways of being distracted has led to um, more uh, accidents in the marketplace. And then the increase in medical costs um, are also driving to higher claim payouts. So uh, there's there's a lot going on here. And what's surprising is, um, you know, with the amount of technology that's going on. Um, when it comes to uh, you know self-driving cars or just technology in general on um, how to repair cars or fix cars or, or whatever, um, you know really hasn't impacted the commercial auto um, uh, markets. So, uh, what else do you have to offer, Michael? Well, um, you know this is an interesting one because obviously there's been fewer people on the road over the last year or so. Um, but for me, what seems pretty apparent to realize how many more liability claims there are in auto insurance um, is what I perceive is just a explosion of attorney advertising. I mean, you can't turn on almost any TV show and not see attorneys advertising to bring me your auto accident. Um, and I'm down here in Florida, and it seems that every couple of miles on any of the main roads, there's a billboard to, to call me about an auto accident. So there's a lot of activity. There's a big marketplace of uh, auto claims going on and in a lot of ways the severity is increasing you know as people drive at higher speeds and highways get more busy um so this one really seems a little counterintuitive being that so many fewer people are on the road and i know that some of the insurance companies in the personal area did return some premiums to policyholders based upon less activity uh, but in the commercial area especially with a lot of heavyweight vehicles on the road tractor trailers and all sorts of trucks um, this market has been under stress for a couple of years, um, but now their rate increases, you know, have even uh, gone up even further. Yeah. So moving on to, to workers' comp, you know, this we mentioned hasn't really been impacted as much. Um, it remains relatively competitive, uh, you know, somewhat flat, if you will. Uh, shrinking payrolls and reclassification of workforces has really ha helped, uh, you know, folks now working from home, um, not really going anywhere, not on site. So that has helped with the with the losses. Um, you know, the the low interest rates have impacted profitability on workers' comp, but for the most part, this is a fairly uh, static product in terms of in terms of pricing. So uh, not really much more to say on that other than um, it is the straw that stirs a drink for a lot of carriers. They, they do want to uh, tie things to workers comp. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about ways on how you can leverage that in, in a little bit further down the road. Michael, do you want to add anything? Well, the presumptive liability is um, a question of how COVID is going to be managed within workers' comp and whether people who contract it through work, whether it's frontline workers or, you know, other people who are exposed, whether that's ultimately going to be a workers' comp case. A lot of the carriers are, uh, or a lot of the states are leaning towards providing coverage on workers' comp that may ultimately have an impact on the market. Um, but as Kyle said for right now, this marketplace is pretty stable, um, which is an indication that, you know, claims aren't really changing and that's really one of the opportunities to use some of these alternative financing ideas that we're going to touch on next first <clears throat> touching on umbrella and excess because this is where um the volatility has has been the greatest um or the the spike has been the greatest uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, a reduction in capacity there have been a few carriers that took some uh some significant losses 
Uh, and so they've completely lost their appetite on, on this risk. And, and that could be uh, per industry. Uh, you know, so uh, depending on the carrier, depending on the industry, they're removing themselves from the marketplace and simple supply and demand. When there's less supply, demand goes up and uh, our demand stays constant. Uh, the pricing goes up. So uh, what we're finding now, and we mentioned earlier, are some of these layered programs or stacked programs uh, in order to reach certain capacities. And when you stack the programs, that also increases pricing. So uh, that's just what is happening in the marketplace. And, and the carriers, in addition to all of that, while raising their pricing, are also raising, raising their retention levels. So uh, deductibles are doubling in certain cases. So uh, you're paying more for less, essentially. So moving on uh, to our next polling question. We talked a little bit about guaranteed cost programs. Uh, do they provide more flexibility or uh, guaranteed cost programs provide you more flexibility, true or false? Okay, we're at about 76% have voted. Waiting for a couple more, it looks like. All right. So I'll give you a clue. 70, yeah, 73% said true okay, and 27 okay. said false. Interesting. Okay. Well, 27% for listening. <laughs> <laughs> we. We're going to move on a little bit. We're going to move on to to why that is the case uh, in in here when we're talking about alternative risk management. So um, this has become uh, the topic du jour over the past couple of months as we're working with clients and uh, they're trying to wrap their brains around. You know, we've only had 50% loss ratios. Why am I getting a 30% rate increase or 15% rate increase? Um, you know, cash flow has been a challenge. How can we how can we manage that? Um, you know, so when you're looking at alternative programs, uh, it takes you a little bit outside the box, as, as the, the phrase alternative uh, implies. But what it is doing is it is making um, you there is no more in some of these solutions, no more efficient way to transfer risk um, or, or manage your risk. So um, when we're looking at the risk financing continuum, there, there are many avenues to take. And so I'm going to let Michael. Uh, walk through what this what this slide is saying here so um you know a lot of our business owners that we work with uh, a lot of our clients um, invest a lot of time effort resources capital into safety in all the areas that we just discussed you know in property that could be a fire suppression system and workers comp it's training um, there are telematics on auto insurance um, there's contractual risk transfer that goes into general liability all of those areas, a lot of our clients are spending a lot of time and money in investing in. And if they're generating the results and keeping their claims down, the question becomes, is it worth taking some of the risk to try and get some benefit on my auto insurance program? And if you look at the left side of the chart here, the polling question we just referred to, the guaranteed cost program, a guaranteed cost program is one where the premium is not ultimately impacted in a given year for the claims activity in that policy year. You pay your agreed upon premium to the insurance company. At the end of the year, the only adjustment is based upon business activity, but nothing to do with your losses. If you look at the far end of the spectrum on the other side, it will be completely self-insuring, which in hindsight might be a good investment, but looking forward, rarely is a business in a position where they want to take all of the liability of property risk or workers' compensation risk that exists in their business um, and risk all their business capital and maybe even the existence on their business by not buying any insurance, assuming that was even a possibility given relationships with banks and vendors and some of your clients. So those programs in the middle are the ones we really like to concentrate on. Where would your business fall in? Which one of these options would make the most sense 
given your tolerance for risk, given your past experience, uh, given your business activity, your size, your capital, what your balance sheet looks at, where we can take on some of the risk of loss, knowing that we're willing to invest time and effort in reducing it, but get a return for that risk at the end of the day. And um, certainly for businesses, as Kyle mentioned, with loss ratios of 50% or less, who are working towards the goal of keeping it at that level over a period of time, those programs we believe are the most effective way to finance your risk. And the idea of considering these programs and the really the calculations of the formulas are changing dramatically given the big increases in premiums. The rewards now are much bigger than they were a year ago. And uh, with this baseline increasing, as we mentioned, I think these rewards are gonna continue to be at least as big going forward. So within that center part of the, um, of the continuum here, we have deductible plans, small and large, which is obviously subjective based upon the business, um, risk plans, risk retention plans, but the one I'm gonna talk a lot about today is a group captive program, because we think within that middle part of the continuum here, that's clearly one of the more effective ways to manage risk. Yeah, and, and it's the one we're seeing the most interest in. We're having a lot a lot of folks coming to us and asking us about them and, and trying to help them yeah. uh, understand them and how they can help their business. The captive so, managers recently are seeing more activity probably in the last year than they saw in five years before that. So what is a captive, Michael? Uh, it's an insurance company that's owned by its insureds. Um, maybe that's a little bit similar to a mutual company, but a captive is clearly different. Um, this is a group of companies or an individual company that has decided that the traditional market, the guaranteed cost market, doesn't serve their purposes anymore. That they're no longer interested in subsidizing businesses who have more losses, maybe even subsidizing their competitors, they want to try and get some return on the investment that they're putting into loss control. They want to find a more effective way to finance their losses, even if it means putting a measured amount of their own capital at risk. And the design of the programs really can determine how much of your capital is actually at risk. Yeah, I think that's a, you made a good point there is subsidizing, you know, your competitors. So uh, when, when insurance companies are, are, are underwriting, you know, in this world, it's a little bit different than it was a year ago. But essentially, they're they're identifying you and classifying you as either uh, standard risk, good risk, or bad risk. And uh, you know, the the standard risk is is you're falling within their underwriting parameters, or good risk or slash preferred risk is is you know that's that's very profitable business, which is designed to offset the mistakes that they made in their underwriting um, or the the blip on the radar where you have the bad risk or the poor risk. So those good risk companies are offsetting the poor performing businesses. And, and so if you are a historically well-run business, do you wanna keep subsidizing the poor risk business? So that's what insurance, how insurance works. But fortunately, if you're that good risk business, there's a solution for you to pull yourself out and, and retain some of those underwriting profits that the carriers uh, are trying to achieve. Yeah, if I could add one thing. Um... You know, every business, um, all, all losses can't be prevented. And every business is going to have a year where their losses are going to be more than expected. Um, but you've got to look at these programs over a period of time. Uh, any one year, the, the numbers, you know, may may um, be off trend. Um, but over time, we believe that, a, a, you know, an investment in loss control programs pays off. Um, and the insureds having fewer claims um are going to subsidize those businesses who are having a lot of claims who really you can't even charge them enough premium sometimes you know for the kind of experience that they're having yeah we have an example later that talks a little bit about you know there's there's that blip on the radar but overall it's run well so we can go through that too so uh moving on to our our next polling question just what day of the week is it <laughs> That question in the current environment. I'm sorry, Joe, what was that? I think a, a fair question in the current environment where it feels like everything is kind of blending uh, together. Yes. 
All right, amazingly, everybody answered Tuesday. Hey, all right, even though we had a holiday yesterday, some of us, you know, some people were shut down, so that was a little bit of a trick question. All right, moving on. So benefits of a, of a group captive. So specifically, group captives have have been the the topic that we've been addressing most because most of our clients uh, or or most of the businesses we're talking to fit into that middle market space. Uh, you know, on occasion we do talk to some clients where a single parent captive may apply. Uh, those are generally uh, much larger businesses and and have much larger risk profiles, but. Uh, group captives seem to fit most businesses, and and for some businesses, uh, they may have always thought that the single parent was the only solution, and weren't really uh, aware of what group captive programs could bring to the table. So uh, there's there's many benefits to a group captive. Uh, one of them being uh, they're turnkey; they're easier to open the doors and get going and, and start to transfer your risk, and and they tend to be um, more uh, cost effective in the administration. Uh, what are some other benefits, Michael, that, that help here? Um, well, um, you know, the insurance companies, we talked about how interest rates are having an impact on reducing their underwriting profit because part of their profit is the money they hold on the float. When an auto accident or a general liability claim or a worker's comp loss first occurs, it can take years before it's finally resolved and the injured party or the third party is finally paid out in the settlement or for the medical expenses in a worker's comp case. Uh, when you're part of a group captive and you're now a part owner of the insurance company, the funds that you're putting aside in your loss account, um, that interest that's earned on it all belongs to you. Um, the group captive managers have an enormous accumulation of funds held in these loss accounts. They use multiple captive, or I'm sorry, investment managers to handle the money and they're returning three or four or five percent on that money historically um, over the last number of years. So the benefits that insurance companies get for, hold, for, for handling your insurance coverage now all are transferred to you as a part owner of the insurance company. Um, these plans are already up and running as Kyle said, the difference between the group and the single parent is you don't need to worry about finding someone to administer the claims. You don't need to find someone to handle all of the legal work, select the domicile, all the other issues that come up in designing a single parent program. These group captive programs are available. And what we help do, depending upon the risk profile, is determine which of these group captive managers based upon industry, possibly based upon domicile, and based upon their experience and their design of the program uh, works best for your business. Yeah, and I think uh, um, what, one of the things we, we glanced, glanced over uh, or glossed over um, is one of the key benefits to a group captive is um, reduced premiums. Um, you are now gonna take advantage of the underwriting profit. So for example, um, if you are paying $100,000 of premium on certain coverage and you're only having $50,000 of losses, you also have fifty-five or $50,000 of underwriting profit minus some administrative costs. In, in a traditional insured world, that underwriting profit would go to the carrier. So now you are retaining that those profits and that cash flow back into the business. So uh, from the simple standpoint of it is more cost effective to manage your risk in a group captive if you have a good risk profile. How are they structured? So they can be a little complex. There are some retention limits, but there's also some umbrella liability that, um, you know, some stop loss, if you will. So Michael, unpack this a little bit for sure. the audience. So the the um the group captive programs are really casualty driven they're looking at the three major lines of casualty coverage workers comp has to be a part of the program you then have the choice of also including auto and general liability if the loss experience there would indicate that it would make sense to include them in the program and also subject to underwriting uh, acceptance by the group captive carrier but in essence the way the group captive program is designed is it provides the primary layer of coverage, whether that's 1 million, 2 million, 
or two million, four million, given some of the, the changing underwriting requirements that we discussed early. The group captive has a retention within that first million dollar layer. And depending upon the group captive manager and the program, that retention can be somewhere from 250,000 to 500,000 per claim. Above that, up to the first million or $2 million worth of coverage, the fronting company provides the balance of the, um, of the limit. So between that captive retention and the full primary limit, the fronting company is providing that difference. Your business will continue to purchase umbrella liability coverage just as if they had in the past. So your total amount of liability coverage will remain the same. But within that captive retention, obviously, most claims are smaller claims, not that many are catastrophic. Frequency is really the measure of how successful a captive program is going to be. Anybody can have a severe claim, but if we can keep frequency down and not have a lot of losses hit that captive retention, monies that are deposited into your loss fund to pay that retention are ultimately returned back to each of the captive group captive participants. Um, and once those dividends are paid out and once those excess funds are returned, that's where you really see the enormous reduction in the cost of your coverage. And that's really the profit that the insurance companies commonly would earn, as Kyle mentioned, which you are now entitled to because you are an equal owner of the group captive with everyone else who is um, a member of the group. Within that captive retention, you know, there's a, you could see there's a slight white line there. They do subdivide that between the really small claims and the slightly more catastrophic claims. Most of the funds put into the loss fund go into the frequency layer, not the severity layer. Um, those are the kind of details when we do our analysis for any single business, um, we'll show and compare how different captive managers do it to select the program that makes most sense um, for anyone who's interested in the program. So Maybe for those a quick question, uh, sorry, Kai, for um, you guys. And I know we have another, we have an example coming up. I, I was just wondering if I'm now, I use the, I'm a, you know, industrial manufacturer. I use the guaranteed cost uh, model right now where I use it for years. And now this is very intriguing what you guys are presenting here. How long is it going to take me to switch from a guaranteed cost to a, you know, group captive model? Is there a certain process in place? And, and what would be the ideal timing to, uh, you know, talk about this and and you guys providing some assessment support in um, figuring out if this is a good solution? But can you can you guys talk about this a little bit? Um, is this like a, a year-long process? Is this, you know, fairly quickly, just as an example? That's a great question. Well, can you go back to your prior slide, Kyle? Um, why I'm doing that, the, the, it's a great question because there is this perception of, of trying to time a, a captive with someone's renewal or with the anniversary date of the captive. And so the answer to the question is, you know, um, anytime, you know, there, there's no great time, there's no bad time to, to explore a captive opportunity because there's, there's never going to be the opportunity or there's basically one in 365 chance that your renewal and the captive anniversary are gonna match up. And so um, you can always uh, term a policy uh, and move into a captive at any point in time. And so uh, as far as the underwriting process goes, uh, where that's where we can help and we can get involved in exploring different captive managers, uh, basically identifying what the business is, the industry that they're in, or specifically what are they doing within the industry uh, what is their uh, risk profile, how big they are, and identifying who the underwriting uh, captive managers are that, that specialize in that, who would be a good fit, and walking them through uh, a feasibility study. Now, the feasibility study, those take a mm, few weeks, um, and then getting uh, propped up on a group captive. The great thing is, is they exist already, so it's not having to start a captive from scratch it's entering one that already exists. So it's essentially plug and play. So it's a fairly smooth transition. And so the, the, the timing really comes on the data gathering and getting all the claims experience and the policies together. So, uh, you know, fastest 
I would say 45 days, 60 days to get into a captive. Um, that's that's the fastest process. But even if you want to go in before, you know what we can do and help is just do a, a cursory look at uh, the past five years of claims and say captive could be a fit, maybe not, maybe a retro program, maybe a deductible program, maybe there's some other solution to help reduce the cost just by taking a look at the past five years of claims. So, Michael, what did you want to add? Well, yeah, to keep the record keeping um, in order, the group captive has to have a common expiry date for all the members of the group. So if the group captive's common date is a calendar year and you join at some other time, all of your costs are simply prorated. There's no negative to joining in the middle of the term. So from a guaranteed cost program, as Kyle suggested, you can leave that at any time and join something like a group captive if that turns out to be the right alternative. If you're currently on a deductible program um, where there are collateral issues to consider, that might be a little bit more complicated. Uh, we think there are some advantages of the group captive for deductible uh, versus a deductible program uh, in that we can include auto and general liability where the deductible programs are usually limited to workers comp or they're separate programs for each line of business. Those are a little bit more complicated, but from a guaranteed cost point of view, um, there's no good time. There's no better time than the present if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So, if you're on the phone and you're curious about captives, you know what, what are some of the underwriting qualifications? Uh, they're they're fairly simple. Um, you know, if if your risk of workers' comp, commercial auto, and your general liability is equal to at least two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of premium then you do have the magnitude to make a group captive uh, potentially efficient process for you. Um, and then the other requirement is the ability to uh, secure the collateral, whether it's through cash or a letter of credit. So, um, Michael, generally, what's what are the parameters around collateral requirements um, relative to uh, loss pick? Right. So the when we get all the historical data on losses and business activity meaning loss runs and prior audits for workers comp general liability and and possibly auto insurance um the actuaries at the group captive will come up with what we call a loss pick what do they estimate that the the losses will be for your business in the current year and from that calculation they will determine what the collateral requirement is going to be um, it's a multiple of that self-insured retention that we showed you in that other slide in the frequency level of that self-insured retention. And the collateral that needs to be posted can usually be provided over the first three years that you participate in the captive. Not need it all at once, put it up over three years, almost all the captive managers are doing that. If you do post cash as collateral, that also earns a rate of return similar to what I described before for the, um, for the amount that's kept in your loss fund, um, the captive managers will um, accept part cash, part letter of credit, as long as the collateral requirement is met, um, they're not concerned what method you decide to use. But the amount is ultimately determined by the loss pick. And that's where our preliminary, if you can provide us some loss information, and we can talk to the loss, to the uh, captive managers and get a sense of what that loss pick is going to be, we can also give you an estimate of what the collateral requirement is going to be. Yep. So moving on to our last polling question, and then we'll close it up with a, a case study. What are required from an underwriting standpoint for a captive? Where are there options, Danny? Yes. Uh, so everybody can select as many as they would like for this. I think in the interest of time, we can close out the poll. I don't know how many people have reply, uh, replied yet, but you know, we want to try to stay to this 11 o'clock time. So, uh, so as we mentioned, just real quick, I'm going to go back and give the answers. $250,000 of premium for work comp, GL, and commercial auto, and the ability to secure the collateral. Those are the underwriting requirements. So fairly simple. 
and then it just comes down to the economics of it. So, Michael, do you want to walk through this case study real quick? Sure. So this is a um, food distribution uh, business that we did a feasibility study and implemented a captive program for. We looked at their losses and their historical premiums. And as you can see, they ran over a five-year period at a 31% loss ratio. There's a delta of $1.7 million approximately between the claims that were paid and reserved uh, because they hadn't all been resolved at this point and the premiums that the client had paid leading to that 31% loss ratio. What you can also see is over this period of time, this business did have an adverse year in 2015 when their loss ratio was over 100%. Uh, as we mentioned before, any business can have that happen to them. But over this five-year period, which is a good period of time to measure it, uh, we have this lower loss ratio of 31%. And their premiums had grown quite a bit, almost doubling over this five-year period. Some of that was rate increases. A lot of it was because this business had grown, um, meaning that you know, in the later years, now that they're up to spending $656,000 a year, some sort of alternative financing technique was clearly called for. So the, um, the actuaries at the captive manager looked at the auto workers' comp and general liability for this business, came out with a loss pick of just under $375,000. The expected losses that they have given their industry, given their sales, given their payrolls, the number of cars on the road in any one year. The cost to run the program, uh, third-party administrators, legal, accounting, reinsurance, fronting company costs, our costs as a broker consultant on it, all included, came in at just under $600,000. So right off the bat, the difference between what they're currently paying of 656 and the cost to be in the group captive created a small amount of cash flow savings right off the bat. In our analysis, what we can show um, prospective participants is, well, where will you be depending upon how your losses come out and where would you have been looking backwards had you been in this program all along? So if this business goes through their first year in the captive and has absolutely no claims, um, if you take their current captive cost of 224,000, subtract from that the interest that they're gonna earn on the money that's in the captive program until the, the uh, distributions are issued, their final cost would only be $180,000. Comparing that to the 656, that they would have paid in a guaranteed cost program, they're saving $476,000. Almost, I mean, what does that work out to? More than 60% of their premium. Now, a year with no claims is probably unlikely, but we want to show the best case scenario. So let's look at 148,000, which is the average amount of claims that they had over the last five years, including, of course, the first year that we show in the historical trend where they had an adverse year and over 100% loss ratio. Even at that, even at that level, at $148,000 in losses, their final cost in the group captive is $328,000. Still, the savings of $327,000 over what they would have paid in a guaranteed cost program. Now, you can argue that that average amount doesn't also include the fact that their business has grown, um, and that's certainly true. But this is also a business that really had great loss control processes in place. So hoping that even with more activity, their average claims aren't going to grow that much. To break even, to pay the same amount in this group captive program that you would have paid or the business would have paid in a guaranteed cost program, their losses would have to be $476,000, a little bit more than that. Again, going back to their historical claims, they never had a year with that much activity, which indicates to me that the chance of this program being successful are pretty good. They may have that bad year, but it, it seems like they would have to have a year that was much worse with claims than any year they've had in the last five years, just to get back to even of what they would have had in the guaranteed cost program. And there is a maximum in these programs. There are stops, stop limits on here. There are circuit breakers so that the cost just can't get completely out of control. And for this particular client, if they hit $641,000 in losses, 
then they would max the program out and it would cost them $165,000 more than what they would have paid in a guaranteed cost program. So it seems to me for a downside risk of what does that work out to about 20 or 25 percent, if they hit that 641,000 number, they're risking that against the potential of saving over 60 percent in a zero claims year, which again is somewhat unlikely, but even in an average year, they stand to save almost twice as much as what they could potentially suffer if they had a loss level year that was far beyond anything they experienced in the past. Remember also that when we're looking at these loss levels, these are the loss levels for that self-insured corridor within the captive program. So if you have $1 million auto accident, that doesn't mean that in this calculation, it's a million dollars worth of losses in the group captive. The amount of the loss is only the part that's within the corridor, which can be anywhere from 250 to $500,000, depending upon the captive program. So catastrophic losses, again, are less likely to move the needle in these calculations. And this is what we show in our feasibility study. Catastrophic losses are much less impactful than, than frequency. A lot of small claims, it's much worse to have $20,000, $50,000 claims than it is $1 million claim. So staying away from that frequency of loss is really the key to making these claims, uh, making these programs uh, effective. Thank you. So with that, are there any questions?